A convenient train whirled him up to town, alone and pondering deeply in a third-class compartment. That singed piece of cloth was incredibly valuable, and he could not defend himself from astonishment at the casual manner it had come into his possession. It was as if fate had thrust that clue into his hands and after the manner of the average man whose ambition is to command events, he began to mistrust such a gratuitous and accidental success. Just because it seemed forced upon him, the practical value of success depends not a little on the way you look at it. But fate looks at nothing. It has no discretion. He no longer considered it eminently desirable all round to establish publicly the identity of the man who had blown himself up that morning with such a horrible completeness. But he was not certain of the view his department would take. A department is, to those it employs, a complex personality with ideas and even fads of its own. It depends on the loyal devotion of its servants, and the devoted loyalty of trusted servants is associated with a certain amount of affectionate contempt, which keeps it sweet, as it were. By a benevolent provision of nature, no man is a hero to his valet, or else the heroes would have to brush their own clothes. Likewise, no department appears perfectly wise to the intimacy of its workers. A department does not know so much as some of its servants, being a dispassionate organism. It can never be perfectly informed. It would not be good for its efficiency to know too much. Chief Inspector Heat got out of the train in a state of thoughtfulness entirely untainted with disloyalty, but not quite free of that jealous mistrust which so often springs on the ground of perfect devotion, whether to women or to institutions. It was in this mental disposition, physically very empty, but still nauseated by what he had seen, that he had come upon the professor. Under these conditions, which make for irascibility in a sound, normal man, this meeting was specially unwelcome to Chief Inspector Heat. He had not been thinking of the professor. He had not been thinking of any individual anarchist at all. The complexion of that case had somehow forced upon him the general idea of the absurdity of things human, which in the abstract is sufficiently annoying to an unphilosophical temperament, and in concrete instances becomes exasperating beyond endurance. At the beginning of his career, Chief Inspector Heat had been concerned with the more energetic forms of thieving. He had gained his spurs in that sphere, and naturally enough had kept for it after his promotion to another department, a feeling not very far removed from affection. Thieving was not a sheer absurdity. It was a form of human industry, perverse indeed, but still an industry, exercised in an industrious world. It was work undertaken for the same reason as the work in potteries, in coal mines, in fields, in tool grinding shops. It was labor whose practical difference from the other forms of labor consisted in the nature of its risk, which did not lie in ankylosis, or lead poisoning, or fire damp, or gritty dust, but in what may be briefly defined in its own special phraseology as seven years hard. Chief Inspector Heat was, of course, 
not insensible to the gravity of moral differences, but neither were the thieves he had been looking after. They submitted to the severe sanctions of a morality familiar to Chief Inspector Heat with a certain resignation. They were his fellow citizens, gone wrong because of imperfect education, Chief Inspector Heat believed. But allowing for that difference, he could understand the mind of a burglar, because, as a matter of fact, the mind and instincts of a burglar are of the same kind as the mind and the instincts of a police officer. Both recognize the same conventions, and have a working knowledge of each other's methods, and of the routine of their respective trades. They understand each other, which is advantageous to both, and establishes a sort of amenity in their relations. Products of the same machine, one classed as useful and the other as noxious. They take the machine for granted in different ways, but with a seriousness essentially the same. The mind of Chief Inspector Heat was inaccessible to ideas of revolt, but his thieves were not rebels. His bodily vigor, his cool, inflexible manner, his courage, and his fairness had secured for him much respect and some adulation in the sphere of his early successes. He had felt himself revered and admired, and Chief Inspector Heat arrested within six paces of the anarchist nicknamed the professor gave a thought of regret to the world of thieves sane without morbid ideals working by routine respectful of constituted authorities free from all taint of hate and despair after paying this tribute to what is normal in the constitution of society for the idea of thieving appeared to his instinct as normal as the idea of property. Chief Inspector Heat felt very angry with himself for having stopped, for having spoken, for having taken that way at all on the ground of it being a shortcut from the station to the headquarters, and he spoke again in his big authoritative voice which, being moderated, had a threatening character. You are not wanted, I tell you, he repeated. The anarchist did not stir. An inward laugh of derision uncovered not only his teeth, but his gums as well, shook him all over, without the slightest sound. Chief Inspector Heat was led to add, against his bitter judgment, not yet, when I want you I will know where to find you. Those were perfectly proper words, within the tradition and suitable to his character of a police officer addressing one of his special flock, but the reception they got departed from tradition and propriety. It was outrageous. The stunted, weakly figure before him spoke at last. I've no doubt the papers would give you an obituary notice, then. You know best what that would be worth to you. I should think you can imagine easily the sort of stuff that would be printed. But you may be exposed to the unpleasantness of being buried together with me, though I suppose your friends would make an effort to sort us out as much as possible. With all his healthy contempt, for the spirit dictating such speeches, the atrocious elusiveness of the words had its effect on Chief Inspector Heat. He had too much insight, and too much exact information as well, to dismiss them as rot. The dusk of this narrow lane took on a sinister tint from the dark, frail little figure, its back to the wall and speaking with a weak, self-confident voice. To the vigorous, tenacious vitality of the chief inspector, 
the physical wretchedness of that being, so obviously not fit to live, was ominous, for it seemed to him that if he had the misfortune to be such a miserable object, he would not have cared how soon he died. Life had such a strong hold upon him that a fresh wave of nausea broke out in slight perspiration upon his brow. The murmur of town life, the subdued rumble of wheels in the two invisible streets to the right and left, came through the curve of the sordid lane to his ears with a precious familiarity and an appealing sweetness. He was human, but Chief Inspector Heat was also a man, and he could not let such words pass. All this is good to frighten children with, he said. I'll have you yet. It was very well said, without scorn, with an almost austere quietness. Doubtless was the answer, but there's no time like the present, believe me. For a man of real convictions, this is a fine opportunity of self-sacrifice. You may not find another so favorable, so humane. There isn't even a cat near us, and these condemned old houses would make a good heap of bricks where you stand. You'll never get me at so little cost to life and property, which you are paid to protect. You don't know who you're speaking to, said Chief Inspector Heat firmly. If I were to lay my hands on you now, I would be no better than yourself. Ah, the game. You may be sure our side will win in the end. It may yet be necessary to make people believe that some of you ought to be shot at sight like mad dogs. Then that will be the game. But I'll be damned if I know what yours is. I don't believe you know yourselves. You'll never get anything by it. Meantime, it's you who get something from it so far, and you get it easily, too. I won't speak of your salary, but you haven't made your name simply by not understanding what we are after. What are you after, then? asked Chief Inspector Heat, with scornful haste, like a man in a hurry who perceives he is wasting his time. The perfect anarchist answered by a smile which did not part his thin, colorless lips, and the celebrated chief inspector felt a sense of superiority which induced him to raise a warning finger. Give it up, whatever it is, he said, in an admonishing tone but not so kindly as if he were condescending to give good advice to a cracksman of repute. Give it up. You'll find we are too many for you. The fixed smile on the professor's lips wavered, as if the mocking spirit within had lost its assurance. Chief Inspector Heat went on. Don't you believe me, eh? Well, You've only got to look about you. We are, and, anyway, you're not doing it well. You're always making a mess of it. Why, if the thieves didn't know their work better, they would starve. The hint of an invisible multitude behind that man's back roused a somber indignation in the breast of the professor. He smiled no longer, his enigmatic and mocking smile. The resisting power of numbers, the unattackable stolidity of a great multitude, was the haunting fear of his sinister loneliness. His lips trembled for some time before he managed to say, in a strangled voice, I am doing my work better than you're doing yours. That'll do now, interrupted Chief Inspector Heat hurriedly, and the professor laughed right out this time. While still laughing, he moved on, but he did not laugh long. 
it was a sad-faced, miserable little man who emerged from the narrow passage into the bustle of the broad thoroughfare. He walked with the nerveless gait of a tramp going on, still going on, indifferent to rain or sun, in a sinister detachment from the aspects of sky and earth. Chief Inspector Heat, on the other hand, after watching him for a while, stepped out with the purposeful briskness of a man disregarding, indeed, the inclemencies of the weather, but conscious of having an authorized mission on this earth and the moral support of his kind. All the inhabitants of the immense town, the population of the whole country, and even the teeming millions struggling upon the planet were with him, down to the very thieves and mendicants. Yes, the thieves themselves were sure to be with him in his present work. The consciousness of universal support in his general activity heartened him to grapple with the particular problem. The problem immediately before the chief inspector was that of managing the assistant commissioner of his department, his immediate superior. This is the perennial problem of trusty and loyal servants. Anarchism gave it its particular complexion, but nothing more. Truth to say, Chief Inspector Heat thought but little of anarchism. He did not attach undue importance to it, and could never bring himself to consider it seriously. It had more the character of disorderly conduct, disorderly without the human excuse of drunkenness, which at any rate implies good feeling and an amiable leaning towards festivity. As criminals, anarchists were distinctly no class, no class at all, and recalling the professor, Chief Inspector Heat, without checking his swinging pace, muttered through his teeth, lunatic. Catching thieves was another matter altogether. It had that quality of seriousness, belonging to every form of open sport, where the best man wins, under perfectly comprehensible rules. There were no rules for dealing with anarchists, and that was distasteful to the chief inspector. It was all foolishness, but that foolishness excited the public mind, affected persons in high places, and touched upon international relations. A hard, merciless contempt settled rigidly on the chief inspector's face as he walked on. His mind ran over all the anarchists of his flock. Not one of them had half the spunk of this or that burglar he had known. Not half, not one-tenth. At headquarters, the chief inspector was admitted at once to the assistant commissioner's private room. He found him, pen in hand, bent over a great table, bestrewn with papers, as if worshipping an enormous double inkstand of bronze and crystal. Speaking tubes resembling snakes were tied by the heads to the back of the assistant commissioner's wooden armchair, and their gaping mouths seemed ready to bite his elbows and in this attitude he raised only his eyes, whose lids were darker than his face, and very much creased. The reports had come in. Every anarchist had been exactly accounted for. After saying this, he lowered his eyes, signed rapidly two single sheets of paper, and only then laid down his pen and sat well back, directing an inquiring gaze at his renowned subordinate. The chief inspector stood it well, deferential but inscrutable. 
I dare say you were right, said the assistant commissioner, in telling me at first that the London anarchists had nothing to do with this. I quite appreciate the excellent watch kept on them by your men. On the other hand, this, for the public, does not amount to more than a confession of ignorance. The assistant commissioner's delivery was leisurely, as it were cautious. His thought seemed to rest poised on a word before passing to another, as though words had been the stepping stones of his intellect picking its way across the waters of error. Unless you have brought something useful from Greenwich, he added, the chief inspector began at once the account of his investigation in a clear matter-of-fact manner. His superior, turning his chair a little and crossing his thin legs, leaned sideways on his elbow, with one hand shading his eyes. His listening attitude had a sort of angular and sorrowful grace. Gleams as of highly burnished silver played on the sides of his ebony black head when he inclined it slowly at the end. Chief Inspector Heat waited with the appearance of turning over in his mind all he had just said, but as a matter of fact, considering the advisability of saying something more, the assistant commissioner cut his hesitation short. You believe there were two men, he asked, without uncovering his eyes. The chief inspector thought it more than probable. In his opinion, the two men had parted from each other, within a hundred yards from the observatory walls. He explained also how the other man could have got out of the park speedily without being observed. The fog though not very dense, was in his favor. He seemed to have escorted the other to the spot, and then to have left him there to do the job single-handed. Taking the time, those two were seen coming out of Mays Hill Station by the old woman, and the time when the explosion was heard, the chief inspector thought that the other man might have been actually at the Greenwich Park Station, ready to catch the next train up at the moment his comrade was destroying himself so thoroughly. Very thoroughly, eh, murmured the assistant commissioner from under the shadow of his hand. The chief inspector, in a few vigorous words, described the aspect of the remains. The coroner's jury will have a treat, he added grimly. The assistant commissioner uncovered his eyes. We shall have nothing to tell them, he remarked languidly. He looked up, and for a time watched the markedly non-committal attitude of his chief inspector. His nature was one that is not easily accessible to illusions. He knew that a department is at the mercy of its subordinate officers who have their own conceptions of loyalty. His career had begun in a tropical colony. He had liked his work there. It was police work. He had been very successful in tracking and breaking up certain nefarious secret societies amongst the natives. Then he took his long leave and got married rather impulsively. It was a good match from a worldly point of view, but his wife formed an unfavorable opinion of the colonial climate on hearsay evidence. On the other hand, she had influential connections. It was an excellent match, but he did not like the work he had to do now. He felt himself dependent on too many subordinates and too many masters. The near presence of that strange emotional phenomenon called public opinion weighed upon his spirits and alarmed him by its irrational nature. No doubt that from ignorance he exaggerated to himself its power for good and evil, especially for evil, 
and the rough east winds of the English spring, which agreed with his wife, augmented his general mistrust of men's motives and of the efficiency of their organization. The futility of office work especially appalled him on those days so trying to his sensitive liver. He got up, unfolding himself to his full height, and with a heaviness of step, remarkable in so slender a man, moved across the room to the window. The panes streamed with rain, and the short street he looked down into lay wet and empty, as if swept clear suddenly by a great flood. It was a very trying day, choked in raw fog to begin with, and now drowned in cold rain. The flickering, blurred flames of gas lamps seemed to be dissolving in a watery atmosphere, and the lofty pretensions of a mankind oppressed by the miserable indignities of the weather appeared as a colossal and hopeless vanity deserving scorn, wonder, and compassion. Horrible, horrible, thought the assistant commissioner to himself, with his face near the window pane. We have been having this sort of thing now for ten days. No, a fortnight. He ceased to think, completely for a time. That utter stillness of his brain lasted about three seconds. Then he said, perfunctorily, you have set inquiries on foot for tracing that other man up and down the line. He had no doubt that everything needful had been done. Chief Inspector Heat knew, of course, thoroughly the business of man-hunting, and these were the routine steps, too, that would be taken as a matter of course by the merest beginner. A few inquiries amongst the ticket collectors and the porters of the two small railway stations would give additional details as to the appearance of the two men. The inspection of the collected tickets would show at once where they came from that morning. It was elementary and could not have been neglected. Accordingly, the chief inspector answered that all this had been done directly the old woman had come forward with her deposition, and he mentioned the name of a station. That's where they came from, sir, he went on. The porter who took the tickets at Mays Hill remembers two chaps answering to the description passing the barrier. They seemed to him two respectable working men of a superior sort, sign painters or house decorators. The big man got out of a third-class compartment, backward, with a bright tin can in his hand. On the platform, he gave it to carry to the fair young fellow who followed him. All this agrees exactly with what the old woman told the police sergeant in Greenwich. The assistant commissioner, still with his face turned to the window, expressed his doubt as to these two men having had anything to do with the outrage. All this theory rested upon the utterance of an old charwoman who had been nearly knocked down by a man in a hurry. Not a very substantial authority, indeed, unless on the ground of sudden inspiration, which was hardly tenable. Frankly, now, could she have been really inspired, he queried, with grave irony, keeping his back to the room, as if entranced by the contemplation of the town's colossal forms, half lost in the night. He did not even look round, when he heard the mutter of the word providential from the principal subordinate of his department, whose name, printed sometimes in the papers, was familiar to the great public as that of one of its zealous and hard-working protectors. Chief Inspector Heat raised his voice a little. Strips and bits of bright tin were quite visible to me, he said, 
that's a pretty good corroboration. And these men came from that little country station, the assistant commissioner mused aloud, wondering. He was told that such was the name on two tickets out of three given out of that train at Mays Hill. The third person who got out was a hawker from Gravesend, well known to the porters. The chief inspector imparted that information in a tone of finality, with some ill humor, as loyal servants will do, and the consciousness of their fidelity and with the sense of the value of their loyal exertions. And still the assistant commissioner did not turn away from the darkness outside, as vast as a sea. Two foreign anarchists coming from that place, he said, apparently, to the window pane. It's rather unaccountable. Yes, sir. But it would be still more unaccountable if that Michaelis weren't staying in a cottage in the neighborhood. At the sound of that name, falling unexpectedly into this annoying affair, the assistant commissioner dismissed brusquely the vague remembrance of his daily whist party at his club. It was the most comforting habit of his life, in a mainly successful display of his skill without the assistance of any subordinate. He entered his club to play from five to seven before going home to dinner, forgetting for those two hours whatever was distasteful in his life as though the game were a beneficent drug for allaying the pangs of moral discontent. His partners were the gloomily humorous editor of a celebrated magazine, a silent, elderly barrister with malicious little eyes, and a highly martial, simple-minded old colonel with nervous brown hands. They were his club acquaintances merely. He never met them elsewhere except at the card table. But they all seemed to approach the game in the spirit of co-sufferers, as if it were indeed a drug against the secret ills of existence. And every day, as the sun declined over the countless roofs of the town, a mellow, pleasurable impatience resembling the impulse of a sure and profound friendship lightened his professional labors. And now this pleasurable sensation went out of him with something resembling a physical shock and was replaced by a special kind of interest in his work of social protection, an improper sort of interest which may be defined best as a sudden and alert mistrust of the weapon in his hand.